torture the speakers by having pizza at noon when they can't get to it. So they're talking, but she's so mean. I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up, but it's Chris Philo Gorgolevsky. Yes. Gorgolevsky. Yes, excellent. Gorgolevsky. Okay, great. So. Um, uh, Chris is actually uh, at Stanford now, and uh, he's doing lots of cool stuff in terms of basically data sharing, um, creating databases, uh, meta-analysis, um, building tools uh, to do cool things with data. So I think this will be a fun talk, and uh, I'm really glad he was able to come out and visit us, and looking forward to the talk and future discussions as well. So without further ado. Thank you very much for having me here, and I hope I will be able to come to you today. That's in front of you. And so the main kind of goal of my talk today is to um, talk a little bit about data sharing and how can you personally, as a researcher, benefit from how to share data and from sharing data yourself. Um, so let's start on this kind of positive note and try to figure out what is out there. Uh, I presume that many of you do brain research and, and are asking all sorts of different questions. And to answer those questions, you have to acquire data. Uh, but quite often, uh, you don't have enough budget to uh, measure everything or have a big enough sample, uh, and you have to learn it yourself. But there are out there data sets that could help you uh, in your quest to understand. So I'm going to talk about a few of those, some of them you probably know, uh, some of them you know, don't, but the purpose of this section is just to show you that there is stuff on board. So the first data set I'm going to talk about is the NPI Enhanced. This is a data set uh, uh, collected by the Nathan Klein Institute in the New York State. Uh, it's done in collaboration with uh, Child Mind Institute by Michael Mulhan and Cameron Crowder. And they are uh, aiming at uh, 1,000 subjects uh, from the uh, Rockland County, and right now they are sharing uh, one third of that they haven't finished scanning. Uh, and it's a representative sample. So they have both young and old people, uh, some with mental health history, some without it. Uh, so you have a, a nice representation of the population instead of cherry picking only the super healthy ones. Uh, and they do a very extensive uh, MRI protocol. So there's the, the standard T1 that you might expect, and there are three uh, resting state scans uh, with different uh, trades off uh, between temporal resolution and uh, TSNR. So you have the ultra fast 645 milliseconds uh, sequences, uh, multi band with all their pros and cons, as well as uh, two and five seconds standard uh, resolution. This is diffusion uh, imaging and some uh, visual checker for the breath holding populations. But this is just MRI, like, this is just the brain part. What we are interested in is how to relate this whole brain part uh, to behavior. So they did extensive phenotyping. They basically tested everything they could think of. Um, so there, there's, there are two days of uh, different protocols, questionnaires, uh, and neurocognitive tasks that these uh, poor volunteers have to go through. Uh, but what it means that you have access to all these measures. And now you can uh, supplement your questions uh, with this data uh, by trying to see uh, how certain things relate to the brain that is specific to your particular reason. And because this is such a broad uh, phenotype, uh, it's quite likely uh, many of the questions you have uh, could be somehow uh, influenced or uh, enhanced uh, by using this data set. And it's going to be much bigger uh, than any uh, data set you can acquire on your own. So I encourage you to go to this website and figure out uh, how this particular data set can help you. Uh, another project that I want to mention is something that you probably heard about. The Human Connector Project had a lot of publicity. Uh, but maybe, actually, maybe let's, let's check that and also who's sleeping already. So who heard about the Human Connector Project? All right, that's, that's excellent. Um, so let me just quickly go through it. This is an initiative uh, in WashU uh, where they are um, trying to scan 1,200 uh, participants 
um, which are both young and healthy, but also include some special populations, like they've got 200 twins, uh, and they've got uh, heritability information from these participants. Um, and they are trying to make kind of state-of-the-art MRI data. Uh, so they've put a lot of uh, work and a lot of uh, time into getting the state of the art sequences. So they've got high temporal spatial resolution on their custom built uh, 3D uh, scanner, which now you can supposed to buy as a level. Um, they've got resting state of MRI. In contrast to MKI enhanced, they've got some uh, task-based MRI as well. Uh, and those tasks include working memory, gambling, multiple language, social cognition, uh, etc. etc. There are only eight of them uh, but that's still already good. They've got diffusion MRI, and uh, what is kind of actually was released recently, the MEG uh, part of the state of uh, And the seven Tesla scanning that they did, the subset of the subject is also coming out. Uh, and they also did uh, rich channel typing, uh, looking at cognition, personality, substance abuse as well. This, the, the genome typing, uh, and that data is coming up very soon as well. Um, and on top of that, there's a lot of methodological development that's coming to that. As I said, it's the custom scanner and custom sequences and require a lot of um, very specific pre-processing, but they figure out how to do it properly uh, using leading experts in the field, um, as well as they are just providing pre-processed data. So you don't have to do a deal with those. So this is the Human Connected Projects. Uh, and you can go to the website and access this data. It's free. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, OK, so there's a question, is anyone actually doing anything with these data sets? Is it just kind of hanging out there, and it's all good because it sounds good on paper, or are people actually um, uh, making some progress in science using those data? So this is a, a function, health function connectomes uh, uh, analysis of reuse. That's another data set that I didn't mention in details. It was one of the early data sharing initiatives where they tried to share over a thousand resting state scans. Uh, and they looked how people are um, using this data set. And you can see that uh, it's not only used for kind of classical research uh, intended for publication, uh, but also used to pilot data grants, to do doctoral dissertations, uh, as well for teaching. Uh, and this data set was reused over 300 times last time it was checked in 2012, so it's, it's even more right now. And when I say 300 times, I mean there are 300 publications that were published based on this data set. Uh, we also looked at OpenFMRI, which is a task-based data set. It's, it's a, the data that is a bit harder to, to share and reuse because it's more specific towards certain uh, questions because this, there's a certain task involved uh, and there's a limited number of other questions that we can ask with a, with a task with FMRI. But you, you can still see uh, a growth in reuse uh, and you can still see that people are using it in different ways. And sometimes I, I was surprised to kind of see completely research outside of the field that will grab this data set and ask questions that we wouldn't be even uh, considering asking. So this is all great, and I hope that I convinced those that were convinced that it's good to have publicly available data lying around, because uh, we can you know, take benefit of it and, um, and, and you know, push our research forward. So, but in terms of data sharing, I think it's a bit like fossil. Everyone knows it's great, but no one really does it. Um, <laughs> and I can kind of give you my little theory of why so. So I think it's about motivation. So if you, if you kind of distinguish between the motivation of an uh, institution who is paying for the research, who is paying for you acquiring the data, for you crunching the data, um, that institution, in their mind, they want to pure schizophrenia. Uh, they don't want to, their, their goal is not you to get the tenure, but to actually solve a certain uh, scientific or medical problem. 
However, researchers are tied in this, in this uh, complex world of different motivations and incentives where they have to you know, figure out how to feed their family and all so, so forth. And they need to make some critical career decisions. And for them, sharing the data is not as straightforward because it doesn't necessarily benefit them directly. Uh, so just to kind of show how does data sharing look from an uh, institution perspective when we analyze open fMRI, which is probably the, the kind of least reused data uh, base out there because of the nature of the data. It's still up to date, say, almost $900,000 uh, if we were to reacquire every single uh, data set that was reused. Uh, so for that, if you share the data, you make more research uh, cheaper. But on the other side, you have the individual researcher perspective, and there are certain fears that they fear. People are fear of being scooped. People are fear that someone else will answer the question they wanted to answer before them. Uh, people fear that someone will find a mistake, either in the data analysis um, or in the design of the experiment. And there are also certain misconceptions of like who really owns the data. Is it the subject that volunteered for the study? Is it the institution who pays your salary and pays for uh, the whole the equipment? Uh, or is it you, the researcher, who acquired the data? And this is somehow reflected in what we see in the literature. There was a recent study some kind of preliminary results showing that studies that are sharing data show higher quality of um, statistical description. So people tend to make fewer mistakes in how they describe the analysis um, or what analysis they do if they are actually sharing data. And that is just a correlation, uh, but it probably shows that people sharing data are those who are more confident about the results. So, that was just an introduction to, to kind of problems and different ways of looking at sharing data. But now I'm going to make the case that there are different varieties of sharing data. That you don't necessarily have to go full on. Uh, and even if you do, there are certain ways that can make your life easier. So uh, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to refer to this uh, figure when we try to show that uh, Probably most cognitive neuroscientists already share some of the data. Uh, and those are the um, peak uh, uh, cluster coordinates reported in uh, papers. So many of the questions in cognitive neuroscience are mostly about where in the brain. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, what you say, you say that a certain brain area is involved in a certain cognitive skill or uh, predicts uh, outcome of a certain and then you say, where in the brain was that? Um, and most of the papers uh, uh, do include um, coordinates of that location, uh, either M and I or the line of space. And this is all great. But when you think about uh, the kind of initial data that comes out of the scanner and the complexity of it and how much information is there, and how it gets crunched and reanalyzed and compressed and reduced to this, which is probably the only machine readable part of uh, reported results in the paper, it's kind of crazy. So you might ask yourself, are we trying to get away? Um, and I think the answer is that it's because we're writing papers. Because papers is the only mean of communication in science that is credited. Um, if you write a complex analysis with code and data, you're not going to get care of that. What people hiring and what the people granting grants uh, are looking at are publications. And those publications, even though rarely actual papers, as in physical objects, they are still confined to the same format. Uh, they are still uh, having to be PDFs that could be possibly printed. And that constraint. And uh, what kind of machine readable data is there? And when we get the result is when you look at the paper, probably half of it, maybe one third of it, is subjective interpretation of the data instead of actual results. Um, but when you think how we could improve this situation, uh, 
we take a conclusion that we have to take baby steps. We need to ask the questions of what is the cost and benefit uh, for uh, sharing. So there's there's sharing of raw data sets, which I'm going to talk about later, and those are the coordinates, which are already in papers. And, and we thought that there is a gap somewhere in between. Is there a, a piece of data that would improve our understanding of the brain and our ability to make inference across studies that is easy to share and we can convince many people to share um, without uh, them putting too much effort? Um, and we came up with a solution, which is this new data based called Neurobolt. Um, and this is a database for sharing statistical ones. I'm threshold with this. A little bit of introduction here. And before we get those coordinates of where in the brain things are related to whatever we're measuring, we usually have a whole brain map. And there are different ways to establish the, the relation between uh, brain and behavior uh, or brain and clinical diagnosis in the whole brain. But nonetheless, you can check it for many different parts of the brain. So why not reporting it everywhere? Well, it wouldn't be feasible in a paper, but most of researchers already have this data. They did this analysis for the whole brain, and they do somewhere have uh, a whole brain and threshold of maps. So we designed a platform for sharing those maps. And we thought, like, let's minimize the cost. Like, let's make it as simple as possible for researchers to be able to upload those maps. We don't want people to spend hours annotating and curating the data set into some obscure format because then no one's going to do it. Um, and then, you know, like, but it's kind of useless without a description. Uh, so we thought that as long as we get the link between the maps and the DOI of published papers, we have the, the most accurate description to hope, hope for. Sorry. Um, and then we can use different tools, automated or semi-automated, to annotate those papers and get better understanding of what is in the maps themselves. So you can put more metadata, but you don't have to if you don't have that. And then we do like simple tricks where this is modern web-based stuff when, when you uh, streamline the login process. So this is how it works. You log in, you create a new collection. A collection is a paper, in other words. And then you add to this collection is this. And now you can ask, like, well, like, what do I get out of it? Like, what, um, uh, what, you know, why would I do it? It takes five minutes, but people will still, still ask the question, why would I even try to do it? Um, first of all, it will uh, increase the uh, impact of your own research. So let me give you an example. Um, when I was doing some uh, metacognition studies, um, in my previous job, uh, we were looking at meta-analysis, uh, which did the subdivision of median lateral prefrontal cortex. And we wanted, hey, we would like to use this subdivision um, to uh, test our hypothesis. We had a task, we had people resting state, we wanted to see it from one uh, region and then the other region. But the way this meta-analysis was reported in the paper, was a screenshot of one slice of prefrontal cortex with green and red colors. And now we have to like look at that screenshot and look at our three-dimensional volume and try to relate that one slice of this three-dimensional uh, feature um, into the uh, space by hand. And there was an accurate and inefficient uh, way of doing that. And now imagine the authors of that study would put their map into Neural, we would have just downloaded it and make much more accurate analysis. And this way, uh, if you do your study and you find something, and you want people to relate to it in a, a quantitative way, for example, they would draw their ROIs based on your results, or they would use seek points based on your, uh, your results. If you put it here, it will be much easier. But that's not all. Um, it's also a great platform for sharing while this study is going. Uh, so how many times you have collaborated with, uh, uh, with a researcher who's not next door and maybe he's not super savvy with all the different uh, uh, software. Uh, he's just getting into neuroimaging, he's more of a psychologist, he can read papers, but if you send him a nifty file, then you have to send him a little essay on how to install FSL. So that's kind of complicated. 
But now you can just upload it and view it in the web browser, not having to install any software. And we have some fancy visualization I'm going to show you. Um, and the last but not least is that we are presenting cognitive decoding. So we had this idea, actually Talia Cohen had this idea, uh, with Neurosynth, where he uh, aggregates results from many different studies and try to figure out whether we can, uh, first of all, figure out what the paper is about. Secondly, group papers that are about the same things. And thirdly, figure out what is the unique pattern of activation um, associated with these papers for this particular cognitive term. And now we can use that, and NeuroVault has this built in. When you upload your map, and then decode it using Neurosyn and give you loadings on different cognitive terms. And that can improve your understanding of the results. So this is how the relation works. I will try to demo it if you have enough time and I can do. Um, and this is how coding looks like. So you get a map and the terms, and there's a spatial correlation between your map and those terms. And you can click through them uh, to get to the papers that contribute to the terms, um, et cetera, et cetera. So now I will do the scary thing where I uh, actually show you how this whole thing crashes. Um, so, so bear with me. If there are any immediate questions, uh, I can answer them right now. Can you guys read this? Should you make it bigger? Can anyone hear me? Right. Uh, so, so this is your vault, and let's say I want to uh, upload some stuff. Uh, and as you can see, there's lots of different metadata I can add here. I don't have to. This is not required. But if I want to help, I can do that. But we want to make the kind of threshold of people who have only five minutes in their day, uh, very, very low. So uh, let's say, let's say I find some mediocre finding, um, and then you have an option to make this collection public or private, and privacy is, um, is done in the very same way as Dropbox does it. So you get the link with the random uh, characters, and only you know that link. If you want to share it with someone, they don't have to log in, they know the secret link. Um, okay, so I'm gonna make it public. Uh, so I create a collection, and now I want to upload a bunch of maps. So I point to the folder, uh, I upload, and those are maps. And now I can go to the map itself, and this will work in, in any other browser. You can just now send that link to a collaborator and say like, hey, look, I found consciousness. And then you're going to say, no, no, you found the motor cortex. Um, so, uh, so that's already useful. Um, and now we also have a three dimension viewer, which is borrowed uh, from Jack Lance Group, developed by uh, Alexander Kuf and James Gao. Um, and and gives you this fancy, shiny um, visualization of the brain, which, which you can rotate. And, and when you think about it, like at least back in the days, um, creating this kind of visualization um, would, would take it me, it, maybe an hour, maybe half an hour, but now you get it uh, very quickly, and then you can inflate it, uh, and if you are a superhuman, you can also try to read flat maps. Um, okay, so this is all great. Um, and now, uh, since that was a demo on uh, a local server, but for the actual decoding, I have to go to the uh, website itself. Um, oh, sorry, wrong website. Uh, but that one is very easy. <coughs> Um, so we have all the different collections here at the moment. Uh, the database is still growing, and we have some collaboration with journals. Neural Image is actually recommending using it right now. Um, and you can see breakout through different journals, and you can 
216 collections and, and half of them are publicly available. Uh, but let's have a look at um, some of them so I can show the decoding in action. Um, so this is from one of my studies uh, in my PhD. Um, and this is, this is the same map, and now when I click the code Neurosynth, um, I'm redirected to the Neurosynth website, um, and now I can see uh, that that map that I foolishly thought was consciousness actually correlates very much with each production. Um, and when I say correlate, uh, I mean the spatial correlation, uh, so I can now hopefully uh, overlay the pattern, the yellow uh, pattern is the is the uh, reverse inference done by Neurosyn and you can see how it overlaps uh, with my map um, and you can see but this is the production the actual task done for this map was moving your lips so that kind of fits um, okay so there are many other features out there and we have an API that allows you as a developer to download many of this uh, data in an automated way. Um, and kind of the more, most important feature um, here is that, and I encourage you to do that, uh, is that if you recently publish a paper that had any claims about location in the brain and you have any sort of statistical map or a parcellation map, uh, please upload to Neurable. And then when you upload or create a new collection, you're going to be asked for a DOI. And if you put the DOI in the paper here, you basically done. You help science. Um, so uh, I very much encourage you to do that. Um, OK, so that was the demo. If there are any questions on this topic, I'm happy to show some other features. OK. Um, so let me go back to my presentation. Right. Cool, so we went quickly to the benefits of using it. Um, um, so I'm not going to repeat myself here. Um, it also gives you a warm and fuzzy feeling that you help future meta-analysis, <coughs> uh, which is undoubtedly very important as we go our lives. Um, but let me show you how exactly that uh, so we, some, a few months ago, when the database was even smaller, um, we ran some meta-analysis on it, basically looking at what's the average across all the maps we have. Um, first, we wanted to see whether we get anything in any way similar to what Neurosynth uh, gets. So Neurosynth crawls papers, and they've got almost 10,000 papers crawled, and they only look at the peak coordinates. Um, so what we did, we uh, so it looks on the peak coordinates and convolves them with the spheres, so it's kind of diluted. So we did that and average across those 10,000 papers just based on the coordinates. And we compared that to taking 300 neural marks, because that's how many we had back then, at the moment we had 40,000. Um, and we thresholded them quite high and averaged them. As you can see, uh, the pattern, so the top row is Neurosynth and the middle row is Neurobolt, um, the pattern is strikingly similar considering how little data uh, we were able to, to pull it from. Um, there are some differences, especially in cerebellum, uh, it's quite concerning. And the visual cortex probably shows that we had a bias towards visual experiments. Uh, but it seems that the pattern in general is quite similar. What is more interesting is where we average the unthresholded norms. So now we're looking at effects that usually were under the threshold, uh, so it would not be reported in this like peak coordinates analysis, but are consistent across the studies. And when you think about it, this is not that unlike many, many studies in uh, MR research are undersampled because data acquisition is expensive. So having uh, relatively small but consistent across studies effect is not unlikely. And what we see here is this deactivation of the default mode network, uh, which is consistent with the fact that we have a lot of uh, task-based uh, maps, 
and it's it's a known fact that the phone network uh, gets deactivated when contrasted with the task. And this is something that you're missing when you only look at the deep core of the thing. Um, okay, cool. I mentioned some stuff about developers. Uh, so we have an active group of people working on it uh, from different laboratories. And we also have an API that allows you to programmatically access the, the data. Um, we also have a new feature coming up very soon, which would allow you to very quickly compare the map that you just uploaded to every single other map that is in the database. And this way, you can discover other scientists and other research um, that elicits a similar pattern of brain activation or correlation. Um, we also work with people working on standards. Uh, one of the standards is called Nightly Results. It's a quite complicated semantic web, very modern standard. Um, and we don't all need to understand uh, the nitty gritty details of it. Its purpose is to accurately describe the results of a statistical analysis. Um, and the good thing about it is that it captures things like residual ones, and the mask, and the contrast, and the design matrix, etc., etc. Uh, all the things that get lost when you only upload the nifty image. So we're supporting the standards, but that wouldn't be enough, because people who actually do analysis have to support it as well. And luckily, SPM12 right now has an export button uh, that allows you to export this kind of files uh, that then you can upload it to your own. Okay, so uh, I talked a little bit about the coordinates, which are in most papers. I talked about neural like somewhere in between. But uh, as probably Vince told you many times, uh, raw data is the only way to uh, answer really modern, really novel questions because there are so many different ways you can analyze one thing. So the question is how, how to make more people share uh, raw data Why people aren't doing that already? Um, so we're trying to really credit where quite the credit is due and solve a problem, solve two problems actually. One is the quality control. Complex big data sets require more effort and time to accurately describe them, to assess their quality, uh, to validate them. And someone has to do that work. We have to acknowledge that. And the other uh, problem is that how do we appropriately reward the extra effort and risk related to sharing data? And the solution that we are trying to promote in the field of neuroimaging is called data uh, Basically, the idea is very simple. Uh, a dedicated publication and as we established, publications are the currency of science, whether we like it or not, but it's unlikely that's going to change in the next five ten years. So we can at least try to hack the system from within. Um, so it's a dedicated publication just for describing the data set. So now you have all the space you really wanted to, to describe your acquisition protocol, to describe the quality of the data, um, and to give credit to everyone involved in the data. And I'm talking here about uh, the research assistants and uh, people early in their careers that their hard work on acquiring data uh, is sometimes, or maybe even often, underappreciated. Um, and what we're doing by this is basically closing the loop. So we have people who are sharing data, and we really have people like MKI enhanced. Uh, or uh, F1000, those people are sharing the data while they're acquiring it. Um, and then people are benefiting from it. People are writing more papers, doing more science, only because this data was available. But now the data producers, or basically you in the near future, uh, can write a paper about the data set. And whenever that data set is being reused, someone cites that paper. So next time you will apply for a grant or a job, you're going to say that I improved science because I've created this data set that was reused that many times and led to these discoveries. And you can quantify it in a way that will be understood by all these review committees because you had this paper that is high set. And now you close the loop and then you get more funding for acquiring more data. Um, so now you can ask, well, it's all great. But which 
journal on Earth would accept a paper like that, a paper without actual analysis, without actual results, just describing data? Well, there are a few options already. Uh, you can go with neuroinformatics and Springer. You could go with GigaScience uh, from Biomed Central, scientific data from Nature Publishing Group, F1000 Research from Faculty of Thousand, <coughs> Data in Brief from Elsevier, and a Journal of Open Psychology Data. And those are those have differences. Some of them one are open access and paid to publish. Some of them are free to publish but subscription free. Some of them are no fees open access because they are funded by some biomedical corporation. Some of them are dedicated to imaging. Some of them are open to all sorts of data. Some of them are dedicated to psychology data, um, etc., etc. And even those that are paid to publish have different fees. For example, Data and Brief will charge you $50. Scientific Data will charge you $900, etc., etc. There are options, but as you can see, uh, if you care about brands, uh, some big publishing houses uh, uh, stand behind this idea, which actually is not that surprising because that's how they make money. But still, there are venues out there, credible uh, publishers, that will accept data papers. And there are examples of data papers. This one uh, I did myself because we like talking about it, I kind of have to show that it In Giga Science, uh, scientific data uh, from nature is picking up and having more and more MRI related papers. I encourage them you to visit their data, data sorry, visit their website. Uh, some of the papers uh, were kind of consortium where the data set was collected by so many different uh, groups. You have many, many authors. So this is um, the F1000 paper, which has been cited hundreds of times right now and, and contributed to the field of rest. Tremendously. Um, and there are also papers um, dedicated to psychology data. So if you only have behavioral data, that is also that can also be an interesting data set. So now the question is, what makes a, a good data paper? Um, and as you can imagine, uh, you can clearly and accurately you should clearly and accurately describe everything you did. So all the acquisition uh, protocol and, and what actually happened in the experiment. You should go into all the details thinking, like, if someone were to take this data and reanalyze it, would they be able to do it without asking me any questions? And if the answer to that is yes, you describe it that is the time. And the beauty of the whole system is that all these different experiments are different. They acquire data differently um, because Somehow it doesn't make sense to the same experiment twice, and therefore it's hard to impose a standard way of describing an experiment. But since it's a paper, it's also peer reviewed. So then you have the quality control. Your peers will go back and say, like, hey, I, I look at the paper, I look at the data set, and there's this Excel spreadsheet, and there's this column called NN27. I have no idea what it means, and no one has any idea what it means. Please improve your description. And here you have the quality control. And here we've got good data organization. This is actually something that you should do anyway. Like when you start doing an experiment, you should think, OK, how am I going to organize my data? Uh, how am I myself not going to get lost in this structure? Then there's ease of access, and then you're blessed with having coins around. Uh, so that's probably very simple for you. Um, as I said, good quality description. So for some data sets, um, it's easy to calculate certain measures. For example, TSNR for uh, EPI sequences. So think about someone found your data paper and thinks that they can answer their questions using your data set, but they also want to assess how good the data is, whether the quality of it is good enough for them to, to do any research with it. And as I mentioned before, fair credit So include everyone that was actually involved in the study. Um, OK, and how can you improve the impact of the dataset? Provide pre-processed data. And that has been quite successful. Um, it takes more time, but it might work. But it's quite successful with HCP. Um, and, uh, and that is quite important when you want to reach out not only to your peers, but people slightly outside of your field. And that's where the real magic happens, uh, where you have a fresh perspective. But for that to happen, you cannot give 
machine learning people titans and say, hey, just do all the stuff that I've learned for years how to do. You have to give them pre-processed data that is easier for them to digest. Uh, so they can treat them, excuse me, basically as a vector of variables. Um, and then you can also try building community about your data. And this is kind of uh, going far out, uh, but there's a good example of uh, the study forest data set, which is a high resolution, ultra high field fMRI with natural stimuli, with seven Tesla stuff, people listening to audio version of the Forest Camp movie. Uh, and they made it available, and he built basically a whole community about uh, around these data set and exploring what is inside. Okay, so where to put data? Uh, there are some field specific repositories. Uh, one of them is the aforementioned open fMRI, which is dedicated to any data set that has any task-based fMRI component. FCP in the will take in resting state of fMRI, and there's also coin, which coins, sorry, which will probably take everything. Um, there are also field agnostic repositories, such as the hardware dataverse, Figshare, which is good for small data sets only, and data drive that uh, may apply some of these. So I'm gonna do a short plug about open fMRI, uh, so we're hosting data sets, as I said, that do have some task-based uh, fMRI component, but also have, can have many other additional uh, data types, such as resting state diffusion uh, uh, and structural as well. We do curated and uncurated data sets, so as soon as you send this to us, we're going to make it available and just flag it as uncurated, and then the creation process will go on. And we are being recommended uh, by uh, a few journals. So if you need to meet that requirement, for example, for nature scientific data, uh, you can do it with us. And kind of last but not least, if you plan to share your data, uh, and I'm talking about the raw data here, mostly because as I tried to show you before, uh, uh, sharing uh, statistical maps uh, is much easier, you have to plan in advance. First of all, uh, Make sure that constant forms uh, include data sharing uh, traits. So we all want and need to be uh, fair scientists and we need to be fair to our subjects and participants and tell them what we are applying to the data. So planning a new study, make sure this is in it. Um, next, decide which database you want to send your data set in advance and then organize your data according to the requirements. Open Fermat has a certain way of organizing data. If you want to make your life easier later on, why not use that scheme to begin with? Um, and then, kind of, sometimes forget the forgotten, but work on anonymized data as much as you can. Because if you work on non-anonymized data, for example, T1s that were not defaced, um, and you have all your pipelines and everything, and then you rush the defacing and remove half of the frontal cortex, and then you um, share this kind of data set, you kind of miss them. But if you do it in the beginning, then you can see whether your analysis are robust to anonymization. Um, okay, and if I haven't convinced you yet uh, why to share data, there are some other arguments that you uh, might want to, sorry, uh, that you might want to uh, take into account. Um, so, first of all, uh, some would argue this is the ethical thing to do. Um, so, uh, according to uh, certain documents on how should, should we treat our participants and volunteers, um, we should uh, uh, not only, sorry, we should not only um, protect them, but also maximize the impact of their contribution. They are volunteering their time and their data to science, and it's our moral obligation is to make the most out of it. And the second thing is that some journals might require it. For example, PLOS One uh, in March started this new policy that uh, instead of data needs to be available upon request, which as many of us know doesn't really work because there are 10,000 different excuses why not to do it, um, data needs to be available publicly uh, upon acceptance or upon publication of the paper. Uh, so if you plan to uh, submit to PLOS One, you need to take that into account. Uh, your funders might require it. And NIH uh, is one of those uh, institutions that for certain grants will require you to share your data. Um, 
And the last sentence is kind of uh, more wishful thinking than actually state of the art, um, but I think that is coming. So track record of data sharing can improve your chances of getting the next one. Because it is in the interest of grant funding institutions uh, to maximize the outcome of their money. And they can do it by making us work together. Um, and if you're interested in, in citations, They've been two studies showing that uh, sharing data is related to high citation rate, uh, and that is while controlling for a lot of other aspects of papers, um, which makes some intuitive sense. But here's the data. Um, okay, so I think that's all from me, and let me thank all the people that uh, work on this, and thank you very much for being such an attentive audience.